So, uh, Pastor Mark asked me to preach a message on broadcasting Jesus. And the way he phrased it to me was, um, there is a lot of mixed messages and narratives and rhetoric that is going around in our culture, and specifically church culture, that is portraying a Jesus in a certain light, and it's not true to who he is. So, you want to shed some light on that. Yeah, so fun. So he leaves me the task of basically saying, like, what is not uh, hunky-dory, so then he doesn't have to get any flack. (laughs) So, here I am. Uh, Please don't get mad at me today. Um, This is a painting by uh, the master of light, the Italian Baroque painter Caravaggio. And he was commissioned by the French cardinal, Matteo uh, Contarelli, And this painting hangs in the Contarelli Chapel altar in San Luigi de Franchesi in Rome beside two other paintings by Caravaggio, one depicting the calling of St. Matthew and the other depicting the martyrdom of St. Matthew. And Caravaggio was ultimately required to produce three versions of this painting that we see. And the first two were rejected by his patron um, because... uh, uh, he had Car- 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 Caravaggio had depicted um, the angel not as being overhead like we see here in the other two versions, but actually intertwined with Matthew, and he was whispering in his ear. And the cardinal said that that um, elicits the sense of direct intervention as opposed to divine inspiration. So he put the kibosh on that, and he said, make a new painting. So this is what we got. So what I want to ask you guys is what stands out to you in this painting? So look at the details, and I'm actually asking for your feedback. So you're supposed to talk to me. Um, What could Caravaggio be trying to say about this moment, about the gospel according to Matthew, and maybe even what it might say about Matthew's understanding of Jesus? And it's art, so you can't give a wrong answer. <laughs> yes? I, the first thing I noticed is that he's looking up at the English direction towards him, like he knows he's there. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, sh- so what she had said was that Matthew is looking up. He's looking up to the heavens. He's seeing the angel. So there's that connection of there's revelation coming from heaven, kind of, right? This is what I'm getting. Okay. The first thing I noticed is him kind of pulling away, the girl's path, leaning away from him. Yeah. And then he's like away from, oh, yeah, and towards what he's, yeah, yeah. towards what he's writing. Yes. Yeah, like his, his body language, she's noting, is almost like hesitant. Like he's, he's not quite with the angel. He's more pressing into what he's doing. There's this hesitation, this pause. What, what am I writing? What am I doing? Yeah. A few more. Yeah. Yes. I like that. Did you listen to the first uh, sermon? Okay. <laughs> Most of the interactions with the angels, people think they're going to die. They're going to die. They, they fall prostrate. And Matthew's kind of alarmed, but not afraid. Oh, okay. So alarm, maybe some surprise, but there's not this fear. That's awesome. Okay. I'm going to close it out. So here's, here's what I got, which a lot of you kind of pointed out. I'm just going to say some other things. So, Matthew stands at the scribe's table with sober expression, quill in hand, looking up to the heavens, as you had said, um, for instruction or inspiration as to what he should write. And notice the writer's stool with three legs that are on the ground and the fourth that's floating, dependent upon the support of the three. Here, Caravaggio might be drawing the observer to ponder the surety of what St. Matthew would ultimately pen. Also, with the three legs stably grounded on firm foundation, the observer is uh, drawn to ponder this holy moment as being supported and grounded on the foundation of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I'd I'd also add, too, that, remember, the gospel according to Matthew is one of three that are in our canon of Scripture. 
So it's kind of interesting that there's three legs that are on the firm foundation and one that's floating. So I would kind of say maybe that fourth one that's floating is kind of like Matthew, where he's dependent and trusting and leaning in as he's writing his gospel. Uh, Notice the faint halo surrounding Matthew's head. Matthew was anointed and chosen by God for the purpose of writing his account of the gospel narrative. It looks as if Matthew is in mid-sentence, as if um, he's looking to the angel for further direction. The angel's presence denotes this otherworldly or heavenly presence that Caravaggio imagined Matthew must have experienced. And then, as you had pointed out, the angel's fingers... So what if this is actually the angel counting off the 14 generations of Israel from Adam to Abraham to Jacob to Judah all the way to Jesus as Matthew's gospel opens with the genealogy of Jesus? It's kind of fun, right? Um, Could Caravaggio be playing with the idea that God had sent a messenger angel, a ministering spirit, to Matthew as he wrote the gospel, but if you look at the lighting... The light is coming from the upper left part off the canvas. So it's as if while there is the ministering spirit of the Lord, there's the Lord's presence is not physically seen, but it's casting a light. So his presence was there illuminating Matthew's heart and mind and guiding him in the process. So the reason that I showed you this, and we did this little exercise, is because I wanted to make a couple points So one, I hope that this exemplifies the powerful reality of Matthew's task to reinterpret Israel's scriptures. Just as Caravaggio had to decide which details to include and which to leave out, so did Matthew. Caravaggio had to determine how he would paint the scene of Matthew's inspiration in order to convey particular understandings of Jesus, Israel's messianic hope, and Jesus' vision of discipleship. And then secondly, think now you're in Matthew's place. You are tasked to sit down and write a gospel account of Jesus. Where do you begin? How do you use the literary structures like Matthew did? Things like genre, because gospel is a brand new genre. It's not quite Greco-Roman biography. It's not quite uh, in accordance with like the Chronicles or First and Second Samuel, like of, of Israel's uh, Old Testament. You know, it, it's not quite the same thing. So there's a completely new genre that he creates, and these other gospel writers create. They use themes like motifs and symbolism and typology and climax. These things like we're meant to look at it like a beautiful piece of literature that is telling us exactly who. Matthew says Jesus is, and it's meant to make a significant and lasting impact on us and shape us. So if you were to do that, how would you do it? How would you tell the story of Jesus? That's what gospel writing is all about. So in their day, all there was was writing, maybe speeching, or speeching, I was going to say speech acts, like dramatized speech. But um, today, there's lots of different platforms and medias for disseminating information, so how would you choose? Which, where would you start? And, and how would you tell the story? These are the kind of things that I want us to be thinking about this morning as we kind of go through this. So this morning, we're going to isolate ourselves to only Matthew's gospel. We're not going to look at Matthew, Mark, or sorry, Mark, Luke, or John, or, or really anywhere else. We're just going to stick to Matthew's gospel and where Matthew's gospel, because of these different elements that I have just talked about, where those things draw us and take us to other parts of scripture, if they do. But we're going to leave out other things. So this doesn't mean that what we're going to do this morning is like, this is all there is and that's it. We're just going to resist the urge to try to grab everything else and come up with some sort of synthesis of what the whole Bible says. We're just going to say, this is the gospel according to Matthew, and it's a particular reading that we're going to do. So a simple way of understanding the way that Matthew wrote his gospel is to make five strategic incisions in Mark's gospel. So you have Mark's gospel here, and then you go snip, 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 snip. And then you take these huge teaching blocks and you upload them in all the places where there is an incision made. Now you have this really big gospel full of all kinds of deep, dense, 
wisdom teachings and literature. This is Matthew's gospel. So for our purposes this morning, we can pretty confidently say if we want to understand what did Jesus teach on a regular basis, what was this gospel of the kingdom that he talked about, we can look to Matthew's gospel and we can find his teachings. Because the Sermon on the Mount, even though it's just in Matthew's gospel, with minor exception of Luke, he adds a tidbit in there, uh, this, among most scholars, they say this is pretty much what Jesus taught day in and day out. More or less, this is the kind of stuff he said. So we get a pretty good take on who Jesus is and what he's all about. And this material, this teaching material, largely constitutes uh, the uniqueness of Matthew's gospel. So Matthew wants to portray Jesus as the rabbi that supplants all other rabbis. He is the teacher above all other teachers. There is no teacher greater than Jesus. Um, He, he is actually wisdom in accordance with the Hebrew scriptures. There's a whole wisdom tradition in Israel's scriptures. And uh, the Jews of his day would have understood what he was saying as the embodiment of wisdom, which was another prophetic promise of the Messiah coming. So everything he says then is all about his kingdom, which means everything he's going to say has to do with addressing the politics of his day. He's trying to tell you how to live your life. Because politics, it's not a big scary word. It just has to do with the way that we live our lives, the way that our lives are governed and structured. And so Jesus is saying, this is what I say to you. Um, So to be a disciple of a rabbi meant forsaking all for the reward of living into the teachings of your rabbi. For this reason, Dr. Richard Hayes says, to know the Matthean Jesus rightly, that's the... Jesus, according to the Gospel of Matthew, is to acknowledge his authority by obeying his word. Okay, so we're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount, and I want to have a few qualifiers so that you guys don't get super mad at me when we're all done. Crickets, okay, good. It's okay, guys. You can, you can be lighthearted. It's going to be all right. Um, so our time is limited, and there's... There's at minimum dozens and dozens of ways that you can read the Sermon on the Mount, but we don't have time for me to explain each of those different ways and and how they've probably influenced us. So instead, what I want to do is I want to offer a theological reading of the Sermon on the Mount that manages to keep intact the fact that the core of the message is the identity of Jesus as Messiah. This is his gift. These words are he himself, a gift to the people of Israel. That's number one. Secondly, is I want to contextualize it so that it makes sense for us. So in order to do this, I have to pick and choose certain parts of the sermon because we have limited time. And that also means I can't always show my homework which, when I say that, I mean I can't always tell you how I arrive at certain conclusions. And I give you permission right now to disagree with everything I say. (laughs) Okay? So uh, I'm more and more convinced that um, there's not a wrong reading of Scripture. There's just really bad on the spectrum all the way to really good. And why I believe that is important is because the way that you and I are going to read it is going to be different, I guarantee, than the way our brothers and sisters in Asia read certain texts, the way that our brothers and sisters in Africa, we don't read it all the same way, and we can learn a great deal from one another. So rather than pit our readings against one another, I'm just going to offer a reading so that you can hear what it might sound like. So I didn't say this in the first sermon, but I think this might help. Uh, Think of like somebody playing guitar. You can't really play a guitar the wrong way. Like, it's meant to be strummed, plucked, and make sound. So if it's making sound, you're playing the guitar. But there's good ways of doing it, and there's bad ways of doing it. There's ways where the the music sounds beautiful, and then there's ways you do it where it sounds just awful. Like, God bless them. Good, Good try. Okay? So we understand each other? No? 
Yes, okay, good, good. So, as Dr. Stanley Hauerwas says, the sermon is not a list of requirements, but rather a description of the life of a people gathered by and around Jesus. In other words, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is his vision of who the people of God are and how they will live. So, let's start the reading. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Like Moses in the desert, Jesus too ascends the mountain. Moses ascends in order to speak to the Lord and declare his word to the people of Israel, as he says, For you, O Israel, were afraid because of the fire and did not go up the mountain. Deuteronomy 5.5 Consequently, they were forbidden from laying so much as a foot, whether a man's or beast's, upon the mountain. Exodus 19 They had made their choice. Yet in Matthew's gospel, the people of Israel come from Galilee, the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from even beyond the Jordan, to witness Jesus, the miracle worker. Jesus does not forbid their proximity to him. Instead, he bids them to come, to listen, and to be with him. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to another, and who does not swear falsely and deceitfully. As if to dramatize Psalm 24, Jesus boldly preaches against acts of deceit and swearing all kinds of falsities in order to control the narrative. Regardless of people's good or evil intent, Jesus declares all such swearing, narrative crafting, manipulative rhetoric, and lofty speculations, which are incapable of saying simply yes or no to be of the devil himself. Surely these who do such things find themselves struggling and striving to ascend the mountain. Conversely, anyone who is able to actually remain allegiant to Yahweh alone and thereby succeed in abstaining from all vain speculations, attempts for control, and that all too easy misplaced desire for our own voice to be heard, they will be the ones who ascend the hill of the Lord. These pure-hearted ones, Jesus says, will see God. Such a people will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of their salvation, Psalm 24, 5. So Jesus pronounces his enactment of the kingdom of heaven and the flourishing life on all who are poor, the ones ashamed of their poverty, cloaking their insecurity in humor, smiles, and simple gratitude for their meager lives. For them, Jesus offers the keys to the kingdom of heaven, To those who are weakened by oppression, pressed down, and ridiculed for their refusal to compromise their gentility of heart in order to serve the greater good, Jesus promises that the earth will be their inheritance. It is not enough to live and act rightly. It is not enough to demand the observance of the laws of our land. Instead, Jesus requires righteous living. All who sow righteousness, he promises, will reap a harvest of righteousness. It's not enough for us to simply cast our ballots only for the candidate who best fits our understanding of what is right and just. This way only leads in empty promises and our appetites for rightness insatiable. Rather, Jesus calls all who would follow in his footsteps to burn with a flaming desire for Yahweh's righteousness to come like a mighty rushing wind. And this wind of change only occurs when we, the people of God, choose to embody as a localized body of believers the righteousness of God and we go into our communities granting mercy like water to those dying of thirst. For such a people of God, Jesus promises to satisfy their righteous appetites and to pour down mercies from heaven. An easy step in this direction for us is to recognize and to have gratitude that our Father in heaven makes his Son rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Another way of saying that would be those who are righteous and those who are wicked or unrighteous. That's amazing. If God can act so lovingly and overlook evil until it is time, then why can we not act so lovingly? 
Why do we have a hard time extending mercy to those that don't know the first thing about the love and mercy of our wonderful, wonderful Savior? We're called to enact love and mercy, to be peacemakers. Those who take no side other than Jesus. Those who hold the line, not by bending to the agendas of the political right or left, but who remain in steadfast pursuit of King Jesus. To anyone who would be so courageous to take such a stand in tumultuous times, Jesus declares to you that you are the real children of God. Without a doubt, those who find their way to the narrow path, resisting the gravitational pull of the left or the right, will be ridiculed at best. But, take joy in our mockery. We stand in excellent company. Our reward is great in heaven for taking that kind of a stand. (laughs) He says that that is what they, the people of God, the the prophets, they carried this message and the people of God were the ones who persecuted them. It wasn't the world, it was the people of God. Those brave and weary men who, who were used by God and spoke truth to power and truth to God's people. And what is this truth that every prophet of old spoke of? It was simple. A call to abandon all allegiances, all hopes, all investments, and all desires other than Yahweh, which were all just idols in one form or another, and return to the loving arms of Yahweh. Some kings of Israel cared little for the people of God, let alone God himself. Their decisions were in their own best interest. Other kings, like David, they longed to serve the Lord wholeheartedly, yet even he made a most grievous error to trust in his own economic system and political ambitions, causing him to take a census of the people of Israel, to trust in what he could acquire, what he could build, the good that he could accomplish. And the people of God whom Jesus has in mind are to be like the prophets, abstaining from all of the the malicious politicking, the trusting in man-made systems, and the giving of even some allegiance to lesser things. For any such people who manage to live into that great demand of devotion to their king, their reward is great in heaven. And prior to diving deeply into his sermon, Jesus specifically establishes what is at stake. The glory of God, which is to say the worship of Yahweh. Should the people of God forget that they are the light of the world, how then will the world come to know the fatherly love of Yahweh? What does it mean to say that we are the light of the world? How then are we supposed to live? What does it mean to let our light and our good works shine before the world for all to see? For Jesus, our lights, our good works, And our refusal to relax our obedience to God is the witness that will win the world over for the glory of our Heavenly Father. Yet Jesus issues a startling warning to anyone who would try to circumvent his forthcoming teachings. For such a person, they will be labeled as least in the kingdom of heaven. All their meditating on scripture amounted to meaninglessness because the teachings of Jesus were too hard for them and they sought ways around having to actually live into Jesus' vision for their lives. And what are examples of the kinds of commands that have been negated or relaxed? They're Jesus' descriptions of living peaceably with our fellow brothers and sisters, of guarding our hearts and minds against the lustful thoughts and lewd behavior, of uncompromising fidelity, of surrendered financial investments and material resources. Jesus calls us to question our investments. What thoughts continually race through our minds? That reveals the mental investments of our lives. What evokes our emotions? 
This reveals our emotional investments. How do we use our financial resources? This, perhaps more than all the others, reveals the trajectory of our lives. We can only have one Lord, one Master. Instead of storing up the ever-elusive sum of financial security, the faithful community of Jesus is to store up the ever-increasing wealth of heaven, namely our lives and our livelihoods laid on the altar of sacrifice daily. In this way, we might learn what it means to live free from all cares and anxieties of this world. Then Jesus unveils the diabolical lie of scarcity, the very centerpiece to the world economy. Somehow the birds of the air do not work for their food. God simply provides them food from the land. The spring flowers do not struggle and strive to grow and create beauty. That is simply the fruit of their identity. They grow. They are beautiful. They are flowers. Yet, as long as we remain convinced that there are not enough resources for everyone on the earth, then we will devour one another by our fears, by our greed, and by our envy. Jesus teaches that we are to love our enemies and pray for our persecutors. He uses a series of questions to drive home his point. A possible synthesis of his leading questions could be, those of the world who know nothing of my inexhaustive love still know how to care for and enjoy their friends and their family. So your task, my children, is to exceed that demonstration of love. Sadly, I worry that we have believed the lie of preservation. We seek to preserve our lives, hoping to find more meaning, enjoyment, and purpose. Rather, Jesus clearly warns us, when you seek to preserve the life you have, you will surely lose it. It will dwindle away into nothingness. But there is real hope for the ones who seek the preservation of others by willingly giving of their own lives. For such people, Jesus promises that they will discover the true meaning of life and they will live it to the full. The snare that lies waiting for the good-willed people of God, us, is to exact our perception of God's justice, which is actually rightness, rather than living righteously, which is to let God and God alone be our vindicator and the vindicator of all those whom we love. Instead of retaliating, or shall we say responding, to violent and abusive acts with further perpetuated acts of violence, or the approval of what we would call necessary forceful response, we are to claim solidarity with our risen Lord who entrusted himself to the Father and allowed himself to be led like a lamb to slaughter, knowing that the Father would raise him and he would be vindicated. Those who respond to violence with our own natural violent proclivities, whether that be physical or probably for most of us, verbal, mental, the emotions we feel, that will only perpetuate the increase of violent rule in our communities, nation, and world. Jesus' words in his sermon against retaliating violently would reverberate like an echo to all the Jewish zealots, insurrectionists, and revolutionaries that were gathered on that mountain that day. Most assuredly, Simon the Zealot, Jesus' own disciple, heard his master's words cut like a blade of the spirit through his pride, his pain, and his desire to stand against oppressive evildoers. To be a zealot in Jesus' day meant that you were passionate for justice and had grown sick and weary of the constant stripping away of your rights and longed for the liberation of your people. You were prepared to take whatever means necessary, whether violent or otherwise, against all those who represented your enemy. Ironically, Matthew for someone like Simon, was the representation of all that was wrong with Israel. He was the tax collector, 
in league with Roman oppressors, the scourge of the people, and he robbed his fellow Jews. He was Jesus' sermon illustration, quote, if he should take your tunic, give him your cloak as well. Tax collectors were Rome's surety that Jews would remain a controlled people by limiting their opportunity for financial mobility. The more Matthew and his fellow tax collectors could steal from their own people, the better for Rome. Matthew was in league with the perpetrators of violence, and Simon was in league with violent revolutionaries. (laughs) Both men were called to be disciples of Jesus. Both men were called to leave their political bunkers and surrender to the love only found in Messiah. Simon the Zealot learned the way of the cross as he walked with Jesus and imitated his master. He learned that true liberation would come not by perpetuating violence under the guise of justice, but by submitting his will and life to the only one worthy of true submission. King Jesus, Prince of Peace. Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus Messiah, their King. Likewise, Matthew had the courage to forsake the very real, oppressive, and violent infrastructures in order to learn Jesus' way of self-giving love and peace. So long as we entangle our hearts with all that we perceive to preserve us, we will crumble and lose our lives in the process. Violence only begets more violence. The problem with violence, as Jesus sees it, is not that it is too powerful. It is that it is not powerful enough. Retribution does not mean the justice of God. Just recourse to the evils of this world begins in weeping and travailing before the Lord our vindication and ends with powerful witness to and solidarity with the Lamb of God who entrusts himself to the one who faithfully raised him from the dead. Instead of living in accordance with the individual rights granted by the inferior political powers of this world, Jesus calls all who follow after him to lay down their rights in repeated acts of self-sacrificing love in order that they might live into the supreme political power in this world, the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, the standard that Jesus sets before the people is perfection. You must be perfect, he says, as your heavenly father is perfect. This is what it means to let our lights shine, to demonstrate our good works for the whole world to see. This is what it looks like to live into Jesus' vision for his kingdom people, which is to say, or which is to say to be the people he has already declared us to be. It is to live in accordance with the teachings of Jesus, and it is to be an authentic witness to the power of God's kingdom, the reality of its nearness, and to extend the hope of its impending culmination to a world that is in tumult. All that time, all things in heaven, or at that time, all things in heaven and on earth will be completely subjected to Jesus, the King. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished. Never before had they heard any teacher, any leader, speak with such authority. Jesus did not say, I give you my teachings which came by Rabbi so-and-so, which came by Rabbi so-and-so, which came by Rabbi so-and-so, which was a common practice of the day. Instead, Jesus just walks in like he owns the place. And he says that he himself is the authority on all that he speaks. As if all authority figures only have their measure of authority because Jesus allows it. The sermon was meant to engender a decision to obey King Jesus and to follow him. Dr. John Stott concludes this of Jesus' sermon. He says, So Jesus confronts us with himself and sets before us the radical choice between obedience and disobedience and calls us to an unconditional commitment of mind, will, and life to his teachings. I want to close today with a sonnet by uh, 
a man named Malcolm Geit. And he wrote this sonnet uh, as a reflection on the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, this is the invitation. Read this as the invitation of what God, what Jesus is calling us into. So the poem is called As If. The giver of all gifts asks me to give. The fountain from which every good thing flows, the life who spends himself that all might live, the root whence every bud and blossom grows, calls me as if I knew no limitation, as if I focused all his hidden force to be creative with his new creation. To find my flow in him, my living source, to live as if I had no fear of losing, to spend as if I need as if I had no need to earn, to turn my cheek as if it felt no bruising, to lend as if I needed no return, as if my debts and sins were all forgiven, as if I too could body forth his heaven. So please stand with me. Uh, ministry team, if you guys are here, I just invite you to come up to the front now, and we're going to have a quick time of ministry. If people would like prayer, um, we can do that, and otherwise, uh, we're just going to pray now, and you guys will be dismissed. Uh, so just thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you most, most, most of all for your love, your mercy, like Paul writes about in Romans 5. Like you actually, in your wisdom, have overlooked all of our failings. You've overlooked the world's failings to act so lovingly. Oh, Lord, help us to do that. Help us to be like you, to be little versions of you in this world. Like John the Baptist prayed that he must decrease so that you can increase. Lord, that's our prayer we just empty ourselves again. We let go of any allegiances, any things that have been really pricking at us and, and trying to get our attention and our affection and that we've got caught up in different thoughts or whatever it is. And we just let it all go again to grab hold of the only true, true love, wisdom, truth, whatever. It's you. So we just love you. We praise you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks.